Hi, my name is Kristen Madden. As the archivist at the History Museum, I know that photos are a great way to document our history. From a 1920s photo of a child playing in the snow to a digital image of a new business opening, pictures help tell our history. Please join me as we take a look back at some of the vintage photos in our collection. Hello everyone. Today we're going to be talking about the 1947 spring training for the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League in Havana, Cuba, and the effects that it had within the league and in the world. In April 1947, all of the league's players traveled by train to Miami, Florida, and then were flown in eight planes to Havana, Cuba for spring training. There had initially been concerns with the various team clubs and the league administration, afraid that the cost from traveling to another country would be too high. These fears were eventually put aside when it was discovered that the cost of training in Cuba, including travel, would be less than their previous trainings in the U.S. The players, however, had other fears. Many of the women had never left their home state before, let alone the United States, and most had never been on an airplane. The players stayed at the Seville Biltmore, an American hotel, and toured Cuba extensively when they were not training and playing games. Jean Fout recalled in an interview that during their stay, the girls had not been allowed to take the elevator at the hotel as they were in training and meant to walk everywhere. A hotel near the Seville had been chosen by the league to supply the women with their breakfasts and dinners, though many were less than thrilled. Unused to the local foods, the women, for a time, lived on milk, coke, ham sandwiches, and whatever was being served as Sloppy Joe's, an American-style bar located between their hotel and the hotel that fed them. Though, within a few days, the women did get fed up with surviving off their meager meals and confronted the league administration, forcing them to increase their allowances for food. Cuba was under a large amount of political rest at the time, still trying to bounce back from the hardships passed on by former President Fulgencio Batista, who would come back into power after a coup in the 1950s. During their time in Havana, the women often saw jeeps with guns in them or the army marching through the streets. On occasion, the players were told to get extra food after a day on the field as they would not be allowed out of the hotel for practices the next day as it was deemed not safe. The players found ways during these times to adjust their meals by lowering baskets from their hotel rooms down to the streets for beverages and food being sold below. The team stayed for two weeks, the first for training and the second for a tournament of four exhibition games. The games were played against their counterparts in the Latin American Feminine Baseball League, the LAF-BBL, formed by Rafael de Leon, a wealthy distillery owner in Cuba. The league was modeled after the All-Americans, wearing similar uniforms and following their rules of play. De Leon worked closely with Max Carey and other league officials to build a baseball park and houses for the players and often hosted them on his estate so that they could learn to play the game in the style of the AAG PBL. Some members of the league would even return in the fall to play more exhibition games in a failed Latin American tour at Havana's Grand Stadium between the Atlantidas and Narentas, special teams that drew from the AAG PBL, the LAF BBL, and the Cuban team, the Colombianas. The league would go on in 1948 and 1949 to tour extensively in South America in the off season. Shortly before the AAG PBL was in Havana, the Brooklyn Dodgers had been training in the Cuban capital because Jackie Robinson, who would become the first African American to play in the major leagues, was training with them. At the time, the city ordinances in Verano Beach, Florida, where the Dodgers normally trained, prevented African Americans and white players from competing on the same field against each other. They feared the trouble training in the South would cause, and Havana seemed like an ideal alternative. Sam Lacey, a sports editor for an African American newspaper in Baltimore, traveled to Havana to write about Jackie Robinson training with the Dodgers. He reported that, I heard the Cubans were deeply religious people. I have learned that baseball is their religion. One of Cuba's favorite amateur players was a young law student by the name of Fidel Castro. 
He had at one time been scouted by two major league clubs and even turned down an offer from the New York Giants. He claimed that he enjoyed playing in Cuba and wanted to continue his studies. Castro would go on to become prime minister in 1959 and then president in 1976. Cuba's deep love of baseball carried over into the world of the baseball femenino, women's baseball. Newspapers from Havana indicated that the AAG PBL players drew larger crowds for their exhibition games at Estadio Latin America than did the Dodgers. The new head of the South Bend Blue Sox franchise wrote, The Americanos became all the rage of baseball mad Cuba. Hundreds turned out to see them practice, and no less than 50,000 wildly enthusiastic fans watched the round-robin tournament which concluded the training program. In the opening games of the final series between the Racine Bells and the Muskegon Lassies, the crowd numbered over 20,000 and gave convincing proof that Cuba had taken girls' baseball to its heart. During this time, many players reported that they had to be escorted to games because the fans often swarmed them and even went as far to try to steal their gear as souvenirs. In the end of the tournament, the Racing Bells won the and received a commemorative trophy from Esther Williams, American competitive swimmer and movie star. In 1947, Eulalia Gonzalez became the first woman from Cuba to play professional baseball in the United States. Shortly after the league's Cuban showcase, more Cuban women began securing contracts with the AAG PBL. Martha Marrero, Luisa Galios, Migdalia Perez, Georgiana Rios, Gloria Ruiz, and Zonia Zaylet traveled to the United States and debuted in the league during the 1948 season. Like their U.S. counterparts, many of the Cuban players had never left home before, and combined with the language barrier, they often grew homesick. Isabel Alvarez reported later in life that, Sometimes when you can't communicate, you feel maybe others don't want you around. Everyone has a clique. They run around together in groups. Despite finally having the opportunity to play the game they loved professionally, many of the Cuban players decided to retire shortly after entering the league. Zonia Zayalet recorded one at bat in one game for the Springfield Sallies during the 1948 season before returning to Cuba. Eulalia Gonzalez, who had been given special permission to enter the United States without a birth certificate, only played for the 1947 Racing Bells before also returning home. Georgiana Rios played in 1948 for the Fort Wayne Daisies in Peoria Red Wings before returning to Cuba. Luisa Galios batted leadoff and played third base for the Peoria Red Wings. In the same season, she was traded to the South Bend Blue Sox and then again to the Springfield Sallies before leaving the league. Gloria Ruiz played outfield for the Peoria Red Wings from 1948 to 1949. During this time, she acquired a batting average of .095 and 12 hits. Martha Marrero and Magdalia Perez both debuted with the Chicago Colleens, and in 1949, they were joined by Isabel Alvarez and Eorcia del Castillo. Castillo left the league after the 1951 season, Marrero continued in the league through the 1953 season, and Perez and Alvarez both stayed until the league absolved in 1954. The All-American Girls Professional Baseball League helped change the face of professional baseball, setting the scene for the introduction of Title IX in 1976. The spring training in Cuba, however, continued breaking barriers in more subtle but just as important ways. In Dan Coben's paper, Latinas in the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, he wrote, From the perspective of Latina baseball players, the league must have been viewed as a tremendous success. They brought national attention to Cuban baseball and transcended race and gender by being widely accepted into a domain previously dominated by males. Thank you for joining me today. This program is a part of our Look Back series. You can find more vintage photos at historymuseumsb.org. Just click on the Look Back icon on our homepage. We're always interested in adding more images to our archives, whether photographs or digitals, from 100 years ago or today. So please contact me if you're interested in donating to our collection. See you next time.